Hello and welcome to the special interview with Vivek Kundra, who has just stepped down as CIO of the U.S. government and is one of the key speakers at the Dreamforce event here in San Francisco. Vivek, thank you so much for talking to NDTV. My first question is largely about your term as CIO. It was fairly action-packed, if I can call it that. Um, you saw the focus of new technologies, especially your cloud-first policy was much talked about. As you look back, what would your biggest achievements be? As CIO. Well, I think um, as I reflect on uh, the past uh, two and a half years, uh, the biggest achievement has been to actually, number one, save taxpayers billions of dollars. We were able to save $3 billion by cracking down on wasteful spending uh, and uh, shifting to more innovative technologies. Number two was to actually be much more transparent as a republic by engaging the American people, be very transparent around how the government was working, uh, to make sure that we were going after the most innovative um, minds across the country to help co-create uh, some of the solutions, because the government does not have a monopoly on the best ideas and the best thinking. That is why it's critical to engage the people of any republic. Uh, number three, I think, would be to actually make sure that uh, from a security perspective that we're engaged with the global community as we look at emerging threats um, around cyber warfare and organized crime and making sure that we're putting the appropriate protections in place. So when you took over in 2009, what were the biggest challenges you faced besides the $80 billion federal IT budget itself? Well, when I first came into uh, the job, uh, after everybody congratulated me, after I talked to the president, uh, was that I was handed a thick stack of PDF documents and people said, well, here are $27 billion worth of IT projects that are way behind schedule, way over budget. And by way behind schedule, I mean these were years behind schedule and hundreds of millions of dollars over budget. Um, and uh, even the president, if you recall, had to fight tooth and nail to get his BlackBerry. Uh, and the way government assigned Blackberries was based on the square footage of your office and how long you'd served in the government. So I said, this makes absolutely no sense. How do you compete in the global economy when you have a bureaucratic system that rewards all the wrong incentives? So very quickly, one of the first things I did is I launched this thing called the IT dashboard. And the idea was to shine light on the $80 billion worth of IT investments across the board. And I literally took the picture of every CIO in the United States government, put it right next to the IT project that they were responsible for, and displayed publicly whether it was on budget or not, how far behind it was, and whether the project was performing or not. Sure. And very quickly, the sheer act of doing that, and the President Obama then uh, got online and started looking at it. We took a picture of that, put it online. Very quickly, CIOs started terminating projects that weren't working. Um, and that simple notion of being open, transparent, and participatory led to meaningful savings in the billions of dollars uh, for the U.S. government. Also, one of the highlights during your term was the cloud-first policy that you brought into place within the U.S. government itself. Take us through the policy itself and the impact that it's had on the government spending on IT itself. It was at the very local level and the state level. It worked um, in the city of Washington, D.C., and also in the state of Virginia. Uh, I saw the amazing opportunity to save a lot of money, but more important than saving money was the fact that you could drive innovation on top of that. Sure. The old IT model, what I call the IT cartel, the way these problems are solved is by throwing more bodies at any problem uh, at exorbitant hourly rates. So you would see projects, I remember sitting in a meeting in the state of Virginia um, where I had a vendor convincing me that uh, they'd done a lot of work. After two years, they basically produced a book for over $40 million. And there was nothing that any customer was really using. Sure. And as I looked at what was going on in uh, Washington, D.C. at the local level too, project after project wasn't performing. When I came to the federal level, I saw this one IT project that the federal government had been trying to implement for 10 years and had spent $850 million and nothing worked. Very quickly I realized that uh, that was the wrong approach, the wrong policy, and I instituted a cloud-first policy. And the reason for that was with cloud solutions, you get value on day number one. You don't have to wait 10 years and spend $850 million to actually use it. 
And when you look at small startup companies and small to medium businesses, they don't go there and say, well, we're going to hire an army of consultants and configure and manage and build all this infrastructure. Day one, they'll go to whether it's Google or Yahoo uh, and fire up email. They'll use Intuit for their accounting practices or Salesforce for their customer relationship management or Amazon uh, to actually run their back end operations. Across the world, I believe that that is the future, um, that companies that can bring web scale efficiencies to the enterprise market, to the public sector, are going to be the winners. All these other companies are basically focused on the past. Also, has the cloud-first policy resulted in the reduction of the dependence of this IT cartel itself? And have you seen any tangible impact as a result of this? Well, so when I first came into office, one of the first things I did, as I mentioned, was institute this cloud-first policy. And I actually launched it in uh, the Valley at the NASA Ames Research Center. Sure. Two and a half years later, uh, we've got Darwinian pressure um, in the federal government in terms of competition, which is very healthy. Companies that have never competed for federal business like Amazon and Google and Salesforce um, are actually competing vigorously. And it's great as a private citizen now and as a taxpayer because the savings are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. What is the kind of resistance you faced when you, you know, talked about these policies within the government? Because clearly they were, these were first time the government itself adopted these kind of policies and you must have obviously faced resistance within the government with at least certain government departments which were not too open about opening up their data especially with regards to security issues within the cloud itself. Well so the, the reality is that you have a class of CIOs who have grown up in the old IT world and it's all they understand uh, for the past 30 years or so. Sure. Um, and um, unfortunately what they tend to do is bring up issues like security, like data residency, uh, as a means of preserving the status quo, which is very dangerous. And the reason I think it's uh, disingenuous is because it's not like the United States government or any government is running all of its IT systems on its own. So as a data point, we spend $24 billion a year on infrastructure. 70% of that infrastructure is not operated by the U.S. government. It's AT&T and Verizon and Quest and all these companies. And a lot of these really large systems, they're outsourced sure. to companies like Boeing and Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. The government isn't managing and running all of them either. Sure. So it's, the reality is they're afraid of change. Uh, and the world is changing and it's leaving them behind. And in this tough physical climate, we can no longer afford to waste billions of dollars when there's a more innovative path that saves money, but more importantly, uh, drives innovation. Also, has the cloud-first policy resulted in the reduction of the dependence of this IT cartel itself? And have you seen any tangible impact as a result of this? Oh, absolutely. So agencies are already identified and are moving aggressively in that space. To give you an example, um, GSA moved 17,000 users to uh, the Google Apps platform. USDA uh, is moving 120,000 users to the Azure platform. Uh, the recovery board has moved to the Amazon EC2 cloud. Uh, and uh, you look at um, what's happening with Salesforce, with the SEC and Health and Human Services. So agencies have moved aggressively in that space. Sure. As you look back, any unfinished business that you'd like to would have, like to see through? Well, I think um, technology uh, and governments in general, it's very much like entropy. Uh, and the law of entropy essentially states that everything moves towards disorder unless you focus on it. So I think on an ongoing basis, it will require everyone to put their wheel, uh, the shoulder to the wheel to continue to move forward. Because in technology, there's not a point you can say, I'm done because it evolves so fast, and that's what makes it really, really exciting. But something personal that you would have seen, you know, I wish I'd completed that and then moved on. Well, I'm excited, you know, I'm, you know one area that I wish we would have done more in was collaborate with Congress to reform how we budget IT. My view was that the way uh, IT should be budgeted, uh, it, we shouldn't be submitting budgets two years out because the technology cycle and the budget cycle are misaligned, so already, Agencies are planning for 2013 budgets, and uh, they can't see the crystal ball that far <laughs> to decide, you know, how do you fund uh, 2013 IT projects. Take us through your experience working with U.S. President Barack Obama, both personally and professionally. 
did it help having him was he as technology savvy and did he push down a lot of your proposals especially which were fairly revolutionary in the cloud first policy for example well so what's been really exciting for me um, has been that I've been fortunate to have worked for a president that actually gets technology is extremely supportive of it and is leading from the top uh, a lot of times I think people may end up in uh, certain roles where they don't have a leader who believes in the work that they do and uh, throughout my tenure, the president has been extremely supportive and has pushed really, really hard. So when I saw him in the Oval Office uh, as I was leaving, you know, we talked about uh, all the reforms that we've driven. Uh, and it was very exciting to have been part of an administration to serve for this president. Also, did it help? him dealing with the whole paranoid within the government about security and data? Well, it was coming from the top, right? So when, when you have the president looking at the IT dashboard uh, and supporting this cloud-first policy, it makes my job a lot easier. But there was paranoid. Well, within agencies, you, you had resistance, um, and some of it was sensible, right? Because it is change. You want to make sure you have a healthy deliberation um, around a lot of these policies. But what we're seeing is a one-way street where things are moving to the cloud.